Hello. Hi, everyone. If you're connecting Hello. to the sound, hi. Um, Hello. Welcome, welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 746 New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a programs associate here at the Rail, and I have the extreme pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Rachel Elena Williams, Tao Lewis, Marlene Bennett Jones, and hopefully we will have Essie Bendolf Pedway here joining us today. We are also thrilled to welcome poet Lynn Patterson here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. And here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we're speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and host. Marlene Bennett Jones is the daughter of Agatha P. Bennett and granddaughter of Delia Bennett. Like, like most young girls growing up in G's Bend, Marlene learned to piece and quilt from her mother and other female relatives in the community. After many years of working in the electronics industry for Lockheed Martin and Raytheon as an electronic technician, Marlene returned to making and quilting when her mother became ill in the early 2000s. When both parents passed, Marlene used all of their clothes to make over 20 heirloom quilts for her siblings and family members. Marlene is one of the oldest G's Bend quilters to continue piecing and quilting. Her quilts have been featured in museums, art galleries, and fashion runways, both in the US and Europe. Uh, Tao Lewis constructs intricate sculptural portraits and quilts using found, gathered, gifted, and recycled materials drawn from personal environments in Toronto, New York, and her family home in Negril, Jamaica. Lewis was most recently on exhibition at the 59th Venice Biennale and at 52 Walker, New York. New York. She is exhibited at, and her work has been inquired by several museums and institutions internationally. Lewis currently lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. Rachel Elena Williams works at the boundaries between painting and sculpture. Her reconfigured canvases unbind painting from the stretcher, avoiding conventional support systems and imagining a myriad of spatial contortions. Williams works, lives and works in Brooklyn, New York and holds a BFA from Cooper Union for the advancement of science and art. Um, we will hopefully have Essie Bendoff Pedway here, the only daughter of Mary Lee Bendoff who um, began, began quilting at the age of eight. Although trained by her mother, Essie developed a distinctive style and was producing accomplished quilts while still in her teens. She has worked for many years making uniforms for the armed forces. Her highly practiced sewing skills enable her to tackle complex quilt patterns and introduce subtle optical effects in, into them. Essie is among the last of the women in G's Bend to continue practicing her craft. And our host today, Thurza Nichols Goodeve, is a writer, editor, and educator who lives in Brooklyn Heights. She was senior art editor at The Rail from 2017 to 2019 and is currently an editor at large here at The Rail. Thank you all so much for joining today. I will pass it over to you, Thurza. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to um, what I hope will be just a, a lovely, warm sort of coffee clatch of a conversation is what I'm looking forward to. Tao and Rachel um, and um, both Marlene and Essie are all, uh, you know, they either have works or family works in the show. Um, I am not the curator of that exhibition. So rather than, um, you know, sort of dragging us through all of the different sort of images of the exhibition, I want people to sort of see what it is, get a feel for it and give you a sense of what I know um, the uh, background and and desires of um, Nikel are. So one thing to know is that this is the this is the second of three exhibitions, and there's going to be actually a kind of I think at the end of this a really wonderful book that we all get to look forward to um, that are sort of focused around the G Bend quilt makers and their relationship to contemporary art. Um, and especially um, Black women's experience um, with abstraction and with everyday life. Uh, 
so the first uh, exhibition uh, was organized at the Franklin Parish um, in 2020. So, and that one was uh, called My Way also, the G. Ben Quilt Makers Contemporary Abstraction. And that was more dealing with questions around abstraction. This um, exhibition um, is also obviously under the theme of um, My Way and um, is incorporating, we also, we, the, the show also has Betty Saar, Faith um, Rangold, has a kind of history situating these quilt makers within, uh, what I love is uh, 60 years of different uh, sort of black women in abstraction and again, everyday life. Um, and the thing that I loved about the way Nikkel was organizing this, is around, and I want us to talk about this, this notion of material reverie, this love of material um, and of everyday life. And it's not even just love, but the um, Tao, you had a really wonderful way of describing it in one of the talks I saw that you gave. Um, you were talking about, so let me find it here. Um, so you say, um, you said a lot of black creation is an upcycling, uh, regardless of a lack thereof, um, or regardless of an access to. You say you would position yourself in the DIY kind of nature. And I obviously this all comes out of that sort of do it yourself nature taking, but what, what you say is you go, but taking things as they are and letting them shine, which I really loved. And then you kind of made this moment and you were very quiet. This was from the R21 description where you said, you, you love to spend a lot of time being swaddled and bonded in the material, um, which is I think something that I would think Rachel, you also um, um, are, are um, you know, that, that, that your work is also involved in. So I just wanted to sort of set that up that I want this to be a kind of celebration of, of, of the show, but I really, I really want this to be about these four women, um, if, well, if we have Essie uh, here, um, women artists and what the meaning of making this kind of work is in your everyday life. But the, the real gift that we have too is, is cross-generational, right? So we're gonna have Tao, and Rachel being able to talk with Marlene and Essie. But um, I think for the people that are here, it might be helpful to have Marlene. Um, I would love you to introduce yourself. He's the name Marlene Bennett Jones, and I'm from G's Bend. I am one of the quilters of G's Bend. Oh. And G's Bend is kind of like an isolated area. And if you blank your eyes, you might miss it, but it's a beautiful place. About how so, many people live there? I'm thinking of maybe 200, maybe. About 200 people total. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we kind of isolated. But anyway, this is where it all started. Um, here in G's Bend, it wasn't like it was mandatory, okay? It was traditional that we learned how to quilt. And mostly we would just stand around and watch our mother or grandmother or the women's in the neighborhood quilt. Yeah. So it, it was like something that, matter of fact, even some of the guys that the boys, they learn how to quilt. Mostly, you know, like learning how to, what we call it, putting patches on pants and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But we all knew how to quilt. So it's kind of like something in the blood. But uh, my grandmother, Delia Bennett, she, she was a great quilter. And I've learned quite a lot from her. Maybe and we could show some of Delia's work in, that's in the show here um, as well. Do you, know, do you know how old you were? Do you remember when you first started to make? What, uh, well, you know, I played around with when I was about eight or nine years old. But just like I say, it wasn't mandatory. We mostly like thread and needles, you know, you know, for the women to kiss. Some of them, they couldn't see that well. So we called needle threaders. We, we would do that, okay? And just hang around them. And they might let us quit a, like a little bit in the corner or something like that, but it was never mandatory. But um, when my mother got ill, I think in 2000, 
I came back to G's Ben and all the women's, it was just busy, busy, busy quilting. And I was trying to figure out what, what this is all about. So that's how I got started, you know, once my mother got sick. And uh, I could remember late at night, uh, the nights were so long and lonely that I would sit in a room with her and she mm -hmm. would start just moving her hands. And I just didn't know what she was doing. So I asked my brother, he says, well, you know, back in the day, they used to sew a lot and they used to patch pants and stuff like that. So I said, well, okay, I can help fix that. So I went, got some pieces and I just laid them out across the bed. Matter of fact, she couldn't talk because she had all times, but looked like she was communicating, you know, with the different colors that I would lay on the bed and she would just take her hands and like press them out. So mm -hmm. then that's the first quilt that I actually made was like a throw for her. And that's how I really got started. And from then on, it's been like, you know, the commercial that came on TV. You don't leave home without your American Express card. <laughs> well, I don't leave home without having my quilt pieces and everything with me. I travel with it. So if I'm at a doctor's office or hospital, I, I could just start sewing there. And that's why some of my pieces are, are made by a sewing machine and some of them by hand because wherever I go, I always carry, you know, stuff with me. So that's how I got started. And I've been, you know, quilting ever since. And I'm finding out that the more I get into quilting, I take quilting now, like communicating with people, like my pieces that I use, they have to communicate with each other. And if not, I have to just take it and toss it to the side. And maybe later on, it's kind of like when you're living in a neighborhood, who, who do you want in your neighborhood? Who could you get along with? So that's how I communicate, you know, like with my pieces now. Matter of fact, I just did a piece and I call it a subdivision. <laughs> and I used the pocket as the clubhouse. <laughs> and, there was, <laughs> and there was other pieces that I used, like had nothing to do with anything. But it's in today's world where we communicate now with people from all over the world. So that's how I am learning to do my quilts now. And of course, I have to have a conversation with every piece that I pick up. So that's how I, you know, keep things going. Could and you talk about the pieces and where they come from, where the materials come from? Um, well, yeah. sometimes sometime I do. And I find that uh, I go to a lot of thrift stores now because I like to deal with old worn stuff because somehow, somewhere they have a history. But if I go and buy the material and it's new, I'm sure it doesn't have a history. Exactly, right, right. So what I do now, I'm learning to go in my closet and pull out old things that does have a history. And I'm still dealing with a lot of my parents' old clothing like my father, he was a minister and there was a particular suit that he would preach. And I think that the subject and title was, it is finished. So I could relate to, to, you know, something like that because it does have a history. So like there's a certain dress my mother wore that everybody fell in love with. So I took those pieces and put them together because it has a history. So that's how I like to deal with, you know, material now. And I'm trying to figure out, back in the day, I'm sure the women went through depression, but there was no medication back then. So I'm sure a lot of them used, you know, like making quilts, you know, to help them with depression because it helps me when I find out that I'm, you know, going into a deep, dark place. I would get up and start, you know, making quilts. So that seems to help me 
you know, a lot. And when the pandemic came, that really did a number, you know, where I could really just take time and focus on quilts and quilts and quilts. Mm -hmm. And that's how I, you know, learned to really, really communicate now with, you know, the pieces and what mm -hmm. gets along and it doesn't have to match. It's just like me living next door to my neighbors. I, I don't have to like my neighbor, but yet and still we get along. So that's <laughs> why I'm learning to deal with the quilts and quilt pieces now. Tao, I wondered if you would want to speak to some of what she said, since it sounds there's there's a lot of resonance in, in, in terms of how you use materials. Um, uh, um, so I'm not, uh, I wouldn't call myself a quilter. Um, I, I wouldn't call myself like a, I, I don't want to um, label myself as a textile artist either, but I think from the time that I started working, um, and sculpture um, and, you know, a lot of assemblage sculptures um, found objects. And then later on incorporating material, um, there's always been sort of a kinship and there's always been um, this through line in, you know, how, um, how we look at materials and how we process um, the emotions um, that happen when we are dealing with the materials and, I think there's also a common thread with just abstract abstracting things. Um, I'm not an abstractionist, but I think that um, when we're looking at the G's Ben quilts, we're looking at like experts in abstracting materials and images um, and stories as well. And that's something that's always been really, really fascinating to me and close to my heart. And it's, it's not as simple as the um, the lines from the R21 video. I feel like it's a bit of an incomplete thought because it's, you know, like I feel like they kind of took a very big conversation about the materials and condensed it into like this very succinct sound bite, but it really is more than, um, it's more than just a connection. So it's a, a pondering and, you know, um, just, a lot of play and a lot of imagination that um, is pulled out of you. And also just like a total surrender to the material um, and to just echo what Marlene was speaking on um, about, you know, letting the things sort of have this autonomy wherein they speak to you and tell you how they uh, want to be used and how and when they are ready um, to mm. be transferred. Um, and it's a give and take. It's not, you know, it's something that like requires a lot of intuition from me and a lot of, um, yeah, just complete sort of surrender between, uh, myself and the materials, if that makes sense. I don't know if that's a totally, um, concise well, thought. Makes a lot of sense. I, I, I'd love to know a little bit more about how you collect your materials. Because there's so much, I mean, every material has so much history in yours as well, in a way yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question right now, because my practice has like spread out in so many ways. And actually just yesterday I had this amazing cabinet delivered to my studio with like 186 different compartments. So I'm getting ready to go through this process of sorting and separating all of my random things, all of my tiny little objects and affects, um, seashells, beads, things like that. And um, I'm sort of in a place now where I have so many different archives of um, objects. Uh, I really want to, I guess, I'm feeling a bit of um, anxiety around knowing that everything is there um, and knowing that I have these things and knowing that everything is one in one place. I've had a bit of a um, just very like uprooted time in my in my personal life. And so this is how I'm kind of exercising a sense of control over my being is by taking all of my things and um, putting them in a in a place and protecting them. Um, I routinely would look on the streets. I kind of just scour. I have my eyes open all the time. I've 
really fallen out of the habit of taking things off the street that started in the pandemic um, because I just felt like it wasn't safe. And I felt um, like I was more self-conscious of how I was being seen, um, you know, doing the scouring and the searching and the wandering. Hmm. Um, but I, I still take donations. I also go to thrift shops. Um, I don't purchase anything brand new. I purchase from Fab Scrap, which is an organization that saves textiles from landfill waste. Um, I still have bits and pieces of my own personal belongings that are from, you know, like almost 10 years ago. Um, and also several things that, you know, are from people close to me who um, desire to have their, their clothing, um, you know, transformed and used in one of my artworks. So, so many different ways to come by material. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always been very open because I believe that there's always an access to art and art making, um, no matter with what you have. I, I never, I'm not afraid of um, running out of anything ever because there's always something to, to make with. Yeah, it's sort of thinking that, that it's the everyday life part of it. And what Marlene was saying is that like carrying her quilts with her wherever she goes, um, you it it it's everything is sort of there in front of you um, and around you, and you can constantly be um, making out of life rather than feeling overwhelmed by life. I feel like um, look at that. That's an image. The passing the greens, but that uh, image that's up is quite extraordinary. Would you talk also about your titling? I I um, I really love your titles and wondered how you come about with your titles yeah um some of them are a bit meandering um i don't love uh having to title my works because it signifies the finishing point of the work and i rarely title a work before it's done um and i'm resistant usually to titling works after they're done um but you know, oftentimes one artwork will have multiple um, different names that I kind of know it as, but um, I don't know, sometimes I make these really long meandering titles that are, sometimes they're even poems because it kind of, it keeps me lingering in that process, if that makes any sense. Sort of like love. Um, and they often come from love notes or poems. Um, I haven't been writing as much recently, but I do um, keep mm -hmm. little notes of different I thoughts as I'm making the work. That's amazing. So that it's, I mean, it, it, it is very much like a language for you. It seems like using these materials. I was thinking about the way Marlene was saying how, um, she learned how to, you know, that the, they don't have to go together. <laughs> I don't know even what that means, but I guess if, if we have certain ideas about how color and pattern go together. Um, but for you, it actually feels very much like a language. So, so do you combine um, poetry and your sort of your sculptural practice uh, together or are they separate for you? No, they're, they can't be separate. Um, yeah. seem like the yeah. same thing. Yeah, they just—they've never been separate. There's always been a written component to everything that I do. Um, even with my last exhibition, I wanted to be really ambitious and, um, you know, put out this like the beginnings of a play that I had started writing, which I decided to reel that idea back in and hang on to it and develop it a bit more. Um, but because I'm developing, you know, narratives and I'm trying to kind of, um, you know, there are figures that reappear in my work that like, I'm, there's a story that I'm developing. Um, mm. I can't, I can't only kind of grow that in sculpture. I have to latch onto it and I have to help it grow um, in writing. Uh, and that helps me because it propels me into the next body of work. You know, they're all connected physically in their material components, but they're also very connected in the world that they come from um, that I keep a record of. 
I mean, that seems very, that seems so clear in the mask show that you had at um, 52 Walker, um, mm -hmm. where, it, it, you know, I could see it, it was almost, um, I mean, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit more. I'm, I'm intrigued by this idea of you writing a play or, or working on a sort of narrative element. Um, it almost seems like you're working towards creating a kind of environment um, and not just sort of static pieces. Yeah. Um, no, nothing is static. I, nothing is static. I, <laughs> uh, I can see my work years and years and years into the future of my practice. And I imagine things reappearing and I imagine bodies of work and how they're transforming and growing um, as the years carry on. I do really want to eventually kind of branch out and experiment with other ways to represent the stories via audio, text, um, a wow. book. But I will never do anything until I feel absolutely sure in it. Like I will not, I, it takes me a long time to look at something and study it. Um, this is true even of the materials that I work with um, before I feel sure about what to do with it. So um, the book is not coming anytime soon. But um, at some point, I'm so I'm glad that we've had this conversation because it's very easy to go and see your work. And I guess maybe I'm thinking of the mask show and have it just it's it's there. It's it's a sculpture. It's it's it is it's static and it's and it's one is in the environment. But there but I love this idea that it's this ever ongoing process that you're drawing together with these materials and words and um, I look forward to seeing, you know, where 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 you go with this. I think it gives a, a, a you know, it's a different it's a different take on the work than just kind of going into a gallery and looking at the work, um, right? Um, Ray, Rachel, do you want to jump in here um, uh, and talk at all, either with Marlene or um, uh, with Tao, in terms of things you recognize as similar in terms of your own practice, maybe? to talk to people about your own practice, um, which doesn't seem to have a narrative quality so much, although you're influenced by Afrofuturism, I know. But um, anyway, sorry. Well, it's really great to be even included in this show. I don't consider myself a quilter or it's something that I'm learning to kind of incorporate this. I think it's conceptually, so interesting what Marlene has negotiated working with works from her family and that are really close to her and transforming them into these abstract representations of people and, and time and of how we kind of exist in objects and in materials and in touch. And I've always been really like, I guess, excited by this idea of the tactile and I feel like my work is more concerned with painting and sculpture and I'm really more kind of focusing on that and I think in this last few kind of shows that I participated in and this thinking I've kind of allowed myself to kind of use the sewing machine which I've always used in my practice in different ways and I think coming to this work you know I really love how Marlene speaks about like patience and you know it, it does take a certain amount of calmness and patience and you're really kind of taking and putting a final like calmness over the experiences mm -hmm. and with my work and the work that I've made for this show it's pretty new in the way that it's has that patience and it has that kind of calmness to it and it kind of finalizes a lot of the things that are in my practice in my studio because I'm working with pits and pieces and I'm kind of allowing these moments to come together this work is almost kind of that scrap of all the materials that I have in my studio so a lot of the times that I'm using um, different types of weights of fabrics and using sometimes I'm usually using different quilts and different blankets and things that are mm. soft and have that sort of kind of material that will go nicely. And I'm really thinking about how the fabric and things butt up against each other and create this kind of stark difference, which is 
what this quilting the, mm -hmm. that is the legacy of quilting so it's amazing to be part of this and to hear Marlene speaking about her work and to hear more about Tao's work and especially the process of finding things from other places it's really exciting because I'm I'm looking and I'm finding things and I'm kind of reacting to that um, and I love that the work here and so much of the work in the show is purely coming from the body and it, it's almost representing the body in that way so it's inspirational in that way for me to kind of see like how much of a conversation there is and being part of um, the show that's actually up right now in uh, Hauser and Worth it's called The New Bend it kind of is uh, kind of going into that same um, history and but also giving this idea of how we can how we've all sort of taken this legacy and kind of incorporated into our own practice and our own thoughts and I love this idea that like, the work and the practice is not going to be it it's, has its life of its own and it's growing and it's morphing and so it's truly amazing like watching and being in this intergenerational conversation. What, what, when was the, um, I mean, you, you've been making work as an artist for you know, a while and, and went to art school. When did you become aware of the, of the sort of history of say the G. Benz quilting or even the, the quilting freedom movement from the sixties or um, is that it something- It feels like something so part of my, like I can't even like you always remember. knew it was there. Yeah, yeah, it's something where looking at quilts and actually looking at African abstraction and African American abstraction is kind of the way that I came to understand abstraction more from my own yeah. understanding yeah. and yeah. and how much the patterns and even the um, symbology can be co-opted and used even in luxury brands we're having you you have these symbols that get morphed into being something completely different so i've always had an interest in it in the way that the um symbology and the the language is almost morphing real life and there's a connection to real life in the abstraction mm -hmm. um, the abstraction is representational as much as it is abstract so those are kind of like how i got into just textile and quilting in general. And th then kind of going from there, seeing how that's incorporated into the textiles and the patterning, which is so evident in this show is seeing mm -hmm. the different symbols and different things that appear in the work. They speak a lot. You also have a lot to say about color. You, you have an yeah. interesting take on color. <laughs> Um, and maybe if you could talk about that in, in, in your work and what, I don't want to put the words in your mouth. I want you to, yeah. So t t tell us about what, 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 what is it that you find interesting about color as an idea in terms of how it reflects culture or not, or, um, well, I definitely yeah. think like, even in this work, that is the swing that I created. It's. There's a really a dichotomy and can, we can really get caught up in this idea of black and white and needing this black and white to kind of balance things. And I love the idea that there is a, such an importance in color and such a narrative in color. And so I think I find so much in the relationship of allowing color to be expressive. I think we kind of, just as um, kind of Tao was saying, there's, an identity to color just as much as there is to this kind of finding scraps and things like that in African-American culture, or just African culture in general, like color kind of has been something that is driving this idea of optimism and hope. And it allows you to sort of, you know, you can kind of express as much as you can in that. And I, and I think that's where I kind of get lost in that kind of, uh, a relationship to color. I found a lot of home in it and I've kind of just allowed that to be something that grows and it explores all the time, I think. 
it's like it's a, this constant game and I really like this idea of like how things are speaking to each other too yeah. right well you know this is such an interesting conversation there's this book that I put it in the um in the chat for people and have, you may have read it or heard of it Michael Taussig's book called The Color of Sacred has anyone have you read that book because it's very much about I have not oh gosh it's completely what you're talking about I mean he's an anthropologist right and he's a fantastic writer but it's really about I mean there's all of this stuff about the sort of <laughs> repressiveness of kind of a, a white culture that you know represses culture and how how represses color um and that kind of um things are in beige and and and, and gray and white and that he ties it to a kind of um Oh, I don't know how you put it, but a kind of a, 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 a European resistance to um, um, color that has to do with uh, uh, a resistance to, uh, you know, other cultures as well. Um, and that I, I always just think about, I love color and I wear color a lot. And what I don't understand is everybody gets so excited and kind of makes a statement about it. Like, oh, you're wearing color. You like, and I'm like, well, who wouldn't, <laughs> Why? you know, like, I mean, I'm wearing black right now, but honestly, if you, you, you know, and, and color is such a conversation, but in, in, and one of the other things I will often think about is when you see pictures of, you know, uh, uh, I don't know. I was thinking about this with with Afghanistan when when the war in Afghanistan was going on. You know, you'd see pictures of 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 women even in the poorest situation. The colors of the fabric and the textures of the fabric are so vibrant and so fantastic. And then you get Americans who might have a lot of money, but they're wearing like really shitty sort of you know sweatpants and 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 whatever, and a kind of um, fear of color. Anyway, so the Tausig book is interesting because it kind of becomes a kind of like almost a psychoanalysis of of culture and color. Um, well, I think that, that's I'm, really I'm, interesting I'm, thinking about the clothes and like the items and the body and how colorful all of the clothes are from G's Bend. It, it really yes. speaks to the people and. That's what I love about that. Yeah. Sorry, I just want to, and sorry to interrupt, but um, we do have Essie here. There's a, oh, just excellent. So, um, just Great. so you're aware, but please continue. Sorry. Okay, Essie, I didn't, maybe, maybe um, let's have Essie introduce herself. Um, and uh, I don't, is she here? Hi, Essie. Um, we had Marlene um, introduce herself and we'd love people because there are people here who don't know um, who you are and your whole family connection and the work that you have in the show. So if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Okay. My, and welcome. My name is Essie Petway and um, I'm from Jeans Bend and I started quilting by looking at my mother, Mary Bendall quilt. But I've been quilting ever since I was, what, about 10 years old or maybe even younger. Wow. Because when we, when I first started learning how to quilt, my mom used to put me in a little corner. But that's how I started, in a little corner. And my stitches always was large and long. And my brother used to tell my mom, uh, don't let her quilt no more quilts because I was told to get caught up in the stitches. <laughs> but I learned how to make smaller stitches as I got older. But I enjoy quilting because it gives you a relaxing stage. It's take away from the stress. Of and when you quilt, you're with other people, right? I mean, is this true, Marlene? The quilting is really a kind of social it's not, you're not doing it alone so much. You're quilting with other people. I, I mostly quilt alone. Oh, you do? Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, I used to do it with a group of ladies, but since I have to be at home taking care of my mom, I do mine at the house alone. Because my mom is uh, at a dementia stage and so here's one of your quilts right in front of us right now. So this is from 1970? Yes. Star Rose, wow. Um, yes. 
Do you remember making that? Yes, I do. <laughs> I was copying off of my mom quilt, but wow. then I broke away from all the, I didn't want it to be exactly like hers. So I just broke away with other pieces and other parts. I always like to use uh, old material. And I'm still with that, that stage where I like using old material. I, I buy new material and I use it sometimes, but I really like working with uh, hand-me-down clothes mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. old and worn out. And one, somebody said something about sweatpants. I love sweatpants. <laughs> That's because true. I'm more comfortable in it. And I made we all do. <laughs> <laughs> I made a couple of quilts out of sweatpants. Oh, I that's sweatpants made out of old sweatpants. And oh. everybody liked how I designed the colors in it. But I just uh pick up a piece and put it there. I never uh drew a pattern out of how I was gonna put it together. It was just like you just, my brother said, explain that. But I just can't explain it. You just pick up a piece and put it there. And then you lay it out. And then when you lay it all out, you might want to, okay, that don't look right. I'm going to switch it around. And then when you switch it around, then it comes to what you want it to be. Well, also, because Marlene was talking about this and certainly Tao as well, that, that, it, 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 you're using old pieces because they have they're like characters they have a history they speak to you they say something right so yes, yeah. I agree, say something about my children when they was growing up they always said mommy you always been mean to us I said I didn't never thought I was mean I was just being strict showing you what life gonna throw at you it's not going to yeah. be good all the time it's going you're going to have some obstacles in the way yeah. you're going to have some problems that going to come up you're going to get sick along the way yeah. uh your children going to stray away and not stay under your control and go to doing things that you didn't brought them up to do so you know all of that come in with the material of the clothes they wore when it was in school mm. And the clothes some people gave me that I used to characterize the people in the neighborhood, uh, how they react toward one another and how we all show different, um, I would, you know, just show difference mm -hmm, between mm -hmm. each other. Do you, because since you, you know, you, you're, you come from such a, such a legacy, I mean, both you and Marlene do, where you've been surrounded by family members making quilts for so long. Can you remember some of the materials that your, your grandmother and your mother also used? And do you still have, do you, you know, go and look for some of those? Because those then carry like, you know, the 1930s in them and the 1960s in them. And um, I'm just sometimes curious. People, sometimes people will drop some material off at the house and and ask me, could I use it? And I say, well, let me look at it and see, can I use it? If I can't, I'll give it to somebody that may yeah. want to use it. Yeah. Like uh, you talking about, we call them dashikis and, and uh, big leg pants, but they wasn't, and bare bottoms and uh, <laughs> what, what else? All, it was all different types of style. We, we call them, the, the style now is the same style we had when we was coming up as a child, but they got different names now. Uh, like the bell bottoms, they call them something else. Now I can't remember what it was. It's, yeah, well, you call that it's hip uh, huggers, little legs. We call them little legs pants. Skinny legs. Yeah, skinny legs. Yeah, they yeah. used to fit tight to your legs, yeah. but we call them. We had all different type of names, and I told them, I said, all this stuff y'all have now, we had it then, but it was a different name. Yeah, well, it all gets, yeah, it all gets recycled. I'm just curious about the, the back to the sweatpants. It, I would think that would be hard to sew. I mean, not, no, it's not. No, it's or not, not hard, but isn't it, it's so stretchy, right? Does it, does yes. it? It is stretchy. All you have to do is take time with it. Yeah. Okay. I like a puzzle. 
I'm like, I like puzzles you're trying to put together. Yes, and, that's what quilt is like a puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And see, sweatpants are like a puzzle. You don't, <laughs> you don't never say like a forest gump say at a time. My mom always tell me a life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. So it's just like that. You don't you don't know what you're gonna put there, and all of a sudden you put that piece there and it fit. Yep, yep. It fits. You know, it's because amazing how all three of you or all four of you um, talk the same way, even though you're such different artists. Uh, Essie, Marlene, uh, Rachel, and Tao. It, 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 there's something very similar about each of you in talking about this methodology and, and, and what you're using. And yet each of you has such a unique um different uh, 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 technique, I, which which brings me to, I, I meant to bring this up earlier, but, um, you know, especially Tao and, oh, this is a nice quote, actually, and this would be, be um, either your mother or your grandmother um, that uh, you can read the That's quote. Amazing. Is that you? No, this is a, a lady that lives in Alberta, immensely that way. But she's oh, say so, so she's she's a relative, not a direct relative. Um, oh, well, you married in the Petway family. I okay, because I I like the way it was about this idea of building the house because um, Marlene was mm -hmm. talking about that I think with the pocket, um, like you start with a bedroom over there, a den over there, in this way that you're sort of building something, and that um, no two are the same. Um, you might use the same material but you would do it differently. Um, I, bet, yeah. I bet that's happened where you've probably seen other people's quilts in the in the neighborhood that use some of the material you've used, I would think, at times. Yeah, it's because like when um, my mom had a lot of old material and my dad had them wove, you know, like you wear a, a pair of pants and then one spot, like the knee, are they um the elbows or whatever mm -hmm. where they put a patch on it yep and you you use that because it's letting you know that these clothes are very worn and you want to keep that family member still in your memories you don't want to let go you ah, want to hold on to history yeah yeah, it's it's so important now because a lot of younger people are starting to understand that, you know, there's so much what do they call it uh, uh, slow. What is it? Fast shopping, slow shopping, whatever. But this idea of constantly buying the newest trends and throwing out your clothes and getting another one and how important it is. And and I love this idea of because I know we all do that. You have we all have different clothing that we just love it because it's worn because it's got holes in it because it might be um as you say a, a patch and instead of going out and getting a new one you patch it because you love it because it's you yeah, know I think we've really lost get, that we lost the, it. it's sort of like a new uh, when you get a pot yeah you, you love cooking yeah and you just love to cook in that pot you don't want and if you get a new pot it don't cook like that old pot so yeah. you, you you like to wear those old clothes and cause yeah. my daughter always tell me, Mama, why are you always wear wet sweatpants? Why don't you just wear she buy me clothes and, and I wear them when I go out, but I like to be com comfortable so I can feel loose and free to if I put like if I get paint on them a uh, a rub against somebody that uh might have some kind of stuff on their clothes. And if yeah. you get on my clothes, it's okay. Yeah, exactly. Right. I throw the washer and be done with it. Yeah, stain, stains shouldn't always be such a, <laughs> we always feel ashamed oh. of our stains, but maybe stains are something good. Um, I mean, we're coming close towards the end. So I'm, I'm wondering if Tao and uh, uh, Rachel want to talk to, ask uh, Essie or um, Marlene anything or have any comments. Um. I was going to ask a question, but I think um, Essie just kind of confirmed what I was thinking about, um, which is that when I saw it, um, I kind of was wondering how many times you might have changed direction 
um, because it seems you you just explained the process um, to me that I had kind of imagined you might have gone through in your head. And I also was wondering, you know, like, because I feel like you were quite young when you made that piece. Yes, that I was. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It just it seemed very kind of out of the ordinary and that it has sort of a shape inside of it. And it's not it just not making up its mind about where <laughs> which direction I wanted to go. <laughs> yeah. That's why yeah. I love it. The reason I, I love it because it, it started out to be an eight star and then you made it into a, a, a swirl a, a swirl wind like a hurricane and you pick up everything a hurricane pick up everything in it mm. and then it's just like I just picked up a piece and put there and then when I pick up another piece and put there it's words mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I had to re make that quilt there all over because my brother had worn it out, and <laughs> he said he didn't want to get rid of it. And I said, "Well, I have to uh, put some more pieces in it to make it still look like the '70s." <laughs> and he said, well. Where, well, where in the world are you going to find that? I said, don't worry, I will find it. And I did. I love it. And he said, well, are you going to give it back to me? I said, no. <laughs> I said, because he wants <laughs> I had to redo it and it's mine now, so I can't give it to you. I'll give you another one. And he said, oh, now you can't do that, sis. I said, yes, I can because I'm an Indian giver. <laughs> But I didn't need no idea. But I told him I can't give it back to you now because my brother got it and he done took it somewhere else. So I don't know where it at. And then he called me and told me, he said, you know that quilt is in New York. It's in New I York, it's on the wall. Yeah. I, oh, I didn't know that. So all of those pieces in there is older material. It's not, you might find a, a couple of pieces in there that might be new, but mm -hmm. you can't tell. What kind of quilts are you making now? Well, somebody wanted me to make a, um, a Auburn quilt, an Alabama quilt. Huh. And I told them, uh, I have never worked with that, but I'll try it. So and what I would did. that mean? Yeah, what does that mean? Like what, a, you mean? Yeah, like when you say an Alabama quilt, what does that mean? Well, they wanted the... Alabama uh signal on it. I see. Okay. And they wanted the Auburn signal on it. And so I had to cut out the pieces, the material, but I wanted to design it my way, not the way it was in the material. Right. Well, that's what we want. Yeah, we would want it to be designed the way, the way, the way you do it. Uh, it's 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 almost two, but I just wanted to mention to people who are watching because of these slides, like this is how complicated and rich the associations are in the show. Um, that here you have a piece from 2015 that is right, so uh, uh, twisted and knotted <laughs> New York Times turned into these fringes. Way so the kind of conversation that's going on in the work, a different kind of materiality. The 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 show also has, um, if we could see some of the yeah, look at these. These are extraordinary and the show also has yeah some of the sculpture that's in there this is also found object work by Mildred Thompson um made from the 90s so um it's a very rich complicated conversation between artists all using uh as she called it this this reverie for material but in I think everyday life and abstraction um in a in a in a way that um I, as I've also said, I think it'll be really exciting to see that then she'll have a third iteration of this show and then a whole book that will be a combination of all three of these. So I think it's 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 really exciting. I just have to say it's been so great to be able to, to sort of chat and uh, 
get to get to hear more of of who you guys are because this is such a personal art form right and and yeah. and it seems to be about you know it's about you know that's why see i mean it makes me laugh to hear your, you talk about your brother and that quilt because it's hanging on a wall <laughs> <laughs> and he wants you know he wants it it's like his thing that he wants to have on him so um this is a beautiful faith wrangled uh from 1974 so that's made around the same time you were making yours um so we're going to be um, moving now to just open it up, obviously, to questions from other people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much for, for this conversation. Um, uh, if anybody does have a question, you can feel free to put it in the chat or, or raise your hand. Um, but our first question today will be uh, from Eleanor. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you so much for this super, super incredible and generous conversation. It's been really, really special. And I'm so grateful to all of you and so grateful I got to hear everything. Um, <clears throat> my question is cut is for everyone, but it's sort of maybe for Tao and Rachel. Um, I noticed where well, you both said that you don't identify as a quilter or you said you're not quilters. So I was wondering what distinguishes the life and work of a quilter and what what is a quilter and why do you not consider yourself a quilter um I would say that's probably the sense of like I mean there's something actually I wanted to ask and kind of just hear more about the freedom quilting bee and the amount of community that does come from working and being in such a tight knit community and that feeling of like, you know, it's almost like you're far away and that almost creates more freedom to kind of have that distance and to be secluded in that way. So I think it's hard for me to say that I'm a quilter when, you know, I'm not creating works that are being used and are coming from people in that way. And so to hear, the total history and to imagine, you know, bodies sleeping with the works that I'm in the show with is is pretty much, I think what kind of distinguishes the work in that way is that that real objectness and that full cycle of um, connection, I think. And I think that's something that is almost inspiring the work and almost kind of conceptually coming through in the work um, as opposed to being fully about it. And I think that's kind of how generations kind of evolve and we can kind of put our own kind of sense of time into the work and things like that, because, you know, this is how we're connecting now. And it, and it is so different than connecting in this way. And that's what's so beautiful about these works is, is that full sense of uh, cycle. Um, uh, I just sort of say that out of deference for individuals who's, you know, history and a lot of meshed in that. This. Sorry, there's something with my audio. You're just breaking up a little bit, Tao. Um, um, put my phone in. Okay. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that I. I don't call myself a quilter just out of deference for people who um whose like personal lives and histories um are you know like very um intertwined in the practice of quilting and also just to sort of um I guess add to what Rachel was saying I I don't really know how one like defines a practice a quilting practice, um, whether you want to, you know, define it based on the the function or the use of the the fabric, um, the quilt itself, 
um, there are definitely like components of um, my practice that involves um, some of the same mechanisms as quilting, but yeah, just for very those very basic reasons, I don't call myself a quilter. Thank you. That was super yeah, informative, helpful, enlightening. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our next question is going to be from Chloe, our programs director. Hi, everybody. Thank you so, so much for doing this today and for this incredibly generous conversation about your work. Um, I really, really enjoyed the exhibition and the chance to hear each of you speak at length about your practices and um, the act of making in the ways that you individually do. Um, my question has to do with the ingredient of time. Um, quilt making, similar to assemblage, has a unique relationship to time, weaving together objects with different memories and origins, which I feel like you each have spoken about at length. But then each of you then sort of pins all of these objects both to yourselves, to this unique moment in time, making them into a unified whole over a period of time itself. And so I was wondering how you think about time when you make your works independently. Um, and it's kind of for each of you to answer. Does anybody wanna go first? <laughs> I see Essie, I'm gonna allow Essie to unmute. So. Not yet. Okay. Okay. There you go. All right. Oh, right. uh, no, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I like to uh, take time and fix my hook. Because a lot of times uh, when I'm up at my mom's, I come home and I'll make a block. And then she'll call me and say, I need you to come and do something. And then I go up there and do what she want me to do. And then when I come back home, okay, another block then popped in my head. It's not the same block. It's a different block. And every time I go outside or do something in the house, the block be different. But it still resembles the first block I made, but it's totally different. And, and time consuming, when I finish making all the blocks, I probably lay them out on the floor or lay them across the bed. Now, how are you gonna put this together? And then I said, oh, okay, I'll take a piece of material and strip it and sew this block, sew this strip onto this block. Uh, a piece of old material and sew this strip onto this block. And then I add the blocks together. And then I put all the blocks together after I've been on put a new, another strip on it. And then when I finish, I done completed a quilt. And one time I was at a museum and um, a young girl came to me and she said, uh, Miss Petway, I said, yes. She said, tell me why is this one piece in here that doesn't match anything? Why did you put that there? I said, just because. It had no significant reason. It was just something I wanted to put there to make it be different. And so she said, oh, okay, well, maybe you know what you're doing then. I'd say, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. You just put a piece in there that just remind you that you need a, a question mark. Why is it there? Why did you put it there? That's just like somebody putting a sculpture together. Why did you add this little thing here onto the sculpture? Cause if I used to ask Mr. On, or not Mr. Mr. Thorndow, he used to uh, make these sculptures and all of his sculptures re resemble some of the quilters, quilts. And I said, 
uh, Mr. Dow, why did you put this, this here? He said, look at your quilt and tell me why did you put that there? I said, um, just because it was there. He said, well, okay. It just because it was there. So it just not because it was something you was trying to do. It was just something that was just there and you wanted to put a brighter color there to bring out the quilt. Is that something else? Thank you so much for that incredible answer, Essie. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, before I ask the last question on behalf of our publisher, I just wondered if if anyone else wanted to expand on that or or add anything from your own practices. Um, yes. Marlene. Uh, this is Marlene. I'm going to piggyback off what she was saying. Um, that little piece is just like cooking food. Uh, you might want it to taste better. So that little piece that she might have put in, it would actually make the quilt pop. It, you know, it, it would get your attention. And uh, I would also like to talk about quilts like the one that my grandmother made and she was born in um, I think 1892 and she, she's gone but she made this quilt but what I did when my parents passed away I think I took 15 garbage bags and I came down and I packed up all their clothing and I made 21 quilts so now they are gone but 50 years from now who knows, maybe a hundred years from now, they could say, well, Reverend Bennett, these are Reverend Bennett clothes. These are Mrs. Bennett clothes. So, you know, history still must live on. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, as far as I'm concerned, it would never be a lost part. You know, it would always be around. It might have had a few dollars. The money's gone, the car's gone, but everybody still got part of mom and dad when they, you know, reach on the closet ship and pull out a quilt that's made out of their clothing. Yes. And that, and that means a lot to me. Thank you so much. That was, that was amazing and so generous of both of you. Um, I really appreciate your answers. The last question I am going to ask on behalf of Thong Bui, our publisher and artistic director at The Rail, um, who is not here at the moment because of a meeting, but who was really excited for this conversation today. Um, and Fong's question, I'm going to read here. First, Fong says... Um, he remembers how clearly it was to see the show, The Quilts of G's Bend, organized by Deborah Singer for the Whitney in 2003, um, partly because it reminded him of the idea of participatory democracy or democratic learning, where vocational training isn't separated from scholarly learning, and where, um, say, without Delta Blues music, there would be no rock and roll or pop music and so on. And as we're getting through a period of reconciliation or acknowledgement of what has been left out, neglected, or overlooked, or I guess we're still in a period of that, um, what do you see can be done to build on the momentum and moving forward artistically, culturally, not politically, as art and politics has never been integrated in the past, um, is his question. No small question. <laughs> No further. There's no to answer. <laughs> That's a tall answer. <laughs> I may need that question repeated. Okay. Yeah. So, the, so the question is what do you think can be done to build on the momentum from the past? 
of moving forward artistically, culturally, um, to integrate art and politics in a way that it has not been historically. To integrate art and politics. Um... Well, I feel like the freedom quilting bee that is amazing. And I feel like I was kind of hoping to hear a bit more about it and the voting rights and, and just all of the kind of isolation that G's been has been through. And I think that something like that is like just so aspirational in terms of molding art and politics. And so I can't even imagine what the next one would be. So I think I just like would love to hear more about it, I guess, but. I agree. I also want um, I don't, to, I don't know if this is overstepping either. And I also would love to hear um, what Marlene and Essie have to say about this, but I think there is something like, I just, I don't think that um, the G's bend quote makers should be seen as a monolith. I think that there um, should be better practices around individuating and seeing specific eras and um, genres, motifs, all of these, um, all of the um, things that exist under, you know, the title G's Bend, there's, um, there's beauty in like seeing the community as a whole and looking at its history and legacy as a whole. Um, but I think studying individuals um, is something that I would love to see more of in discourse around um, that community in particular. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I think everything that was said was well said and well put together. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a lot that uh, you can look into about this community, people coming together and showing their love and struggles. Because a lot of people had, well, when I was coming up as a child, I didn't figure, uh, I used to tell my brother it was hard because we didn't have what my baby brother had when he got older. He got some stuff we didn't get. We couldn't, we, had, we didn't have a television. We had a radio. We didn't have running water. We had to go outside and pump water or go to somebody well and get water. We had to carry stuff at that. Everything, oh man, if I sit here and talk to you about the history of G's Ben, I'd be sitting here all day because there's so much that. But you know, like politics and uh, he's been and mm. couldn't, you know, couldn't be. It's kind of like tied everything together because Martin Luther King was involved. In yes, that. he were. You know, Martin Luther King came down. He was involved with the freedom quilting bee. So that helped put the quilting, you know, be you know, like on the map as well. And voting. And voting, you know, so that had a lot to do with it. When, you, when you're talking about politics and the quilts, you know, kind of, you know, play together there. And brought people out of the coming, not going through the back door, but coming in the front door, mm -hmm. uh, sitting in restaurants, getting mm -hmm. served mm -hmm. instead of having to wait till this section get served and we'll be last, mm -hmm. uh, either be treated like, I want to say it that not seem harsh, but. Treated like a human. Okay. Yeah, treated human. And, 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 and you know, like politics and the quilting, quilting, it's just like 
piece of a quilt. It brought people together, just like he put pieces together. It, it, it brought people together. And it's still, and put, still bringing people together to the point where people from all over the world now is connecting with Jesus being through the quilts. True. And a lot of people that comes here, they want to know about the past. And a lot of times we want to forget the past. We don't want to talk about it because it was hard and it was cruel. And you don't want to hash up so much anger because there's still some anger in some people. But our young people here today, they don't know too much about that. But we can teach them to get past it because we supposed to be united as one, loving each other, forgiving one another, showing brotherly love, sisterly love. And you don't need to bring about what their forefathers did to you or you did to their parents. You need to bring out unity. You need to bring out love. Talk about what's going on now. Make it better. Don't make it worse. Because you need to bring people together now. Because we are getting out of here. We're not going to stay. And we need to know how to Go home. I just want to say thank you so much on behalf of Fong for those incredibly generous answers. Thank you so much. And thank you for this conversation today. You're welcome. And thank y'all for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Really amazing to hear you both speak so freely. Just, it's a truly an honor. I wish y'all could see my mom. She's so sweet. But I got to get back to her now. Really, thank you. Um, yeah, I want no, no adjectives. Just we're incredibly um, grateful and honored to hear you all speak today. Um, we do have a tradition at the rail of ending our events with a poetry reading. And I'm really uh, grateful to have Lynn Patterson here today. Um, Lynn Patterson is a storyteller and book art MFA student originally from Seattle, Washington. She's deeply she is a deeply invigorated poet who's specifically inspired to write about Black diaspora and those who have been mar marginalized in our society as a means of empowering future generations with their stories. Her work has been published in several places, including Pop Shop Magazine and Allegory Ridge's Poetry Anthology. Thank you, Lynn, so much for being here today. I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, hi. First, hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, having me. That discussion was incredible. And um, interestingly, as an artist, I felt uh, so much of my own practice and um, memories reflected in what uh, Tao, Essie, Marlene, and Rachel shared. So thank you all for being so giving with your art. Um, I, I had a whole thing planned for you guys. And then Marlene um, started talking about her mother and her grandmother and um, learning the art of quilting from them. And it made me think about my own grandmother um, who was just the most phenomenal storyteller that I ever had the opportunity um, to listen to. And I learned everything I know about storytelling from her. Um, and so uh, just a few months ago, she joined the realm of ancestors. And so I'm going to perform a poem that I've never performed for anyone for you guys now. Um, and it's called My Grandmother Was a Spitfire. Mm. <clears throat> We were all tasked with editing my grandmother's obituary when she rejoined the realm of the stars. 
We decided to rifle through the hall closet looking for comfort and inspiration. There was a photo of her in a dusty old shoebox, head tossed back at the sun, all gap tooth smile. It struck me that I had never seen my grandmother as a girl, that she had lived her whole life before my own mother became a galaxy. Apparently, she wanted to be a model, but my grandfather's last name made her hopes and aspirations nothing more than a byline. She loved to dance. Legend has it she could move the dead with her feet like congas back when she was all legs. She was a God-fearing woman who never spoke of the Bible. When she cursed you out, you'd swear she caught the Holy Ghost, the way sounds flew off of her tongue like a baptism. She was a phenomenal storyteller. Life wasn't always kind, so she learned to survive by making mold beautiful with her words. We'd all willingly abandon our electronics to gather in silence at her lap. Eagerly await her every punchline and clutch onto our bellies. She could captivate an entire room and turn it into a one woman show. Her children were the loves of her life and she often swallowed herself whole to give them things she never had. Presence, patience, love, Thus she learned to choke down the howl and scream into the ether with a bit more tenderness in order to, for them to thrive. She has survived by seven out of nine of her grandchildren and five great-grandchildren. My cousins and I swapped stories about that one good time she had to spank us. We all agree that though she loved us fiercely, she could be mean, harsh even, but maybe it was because of all of the things that will remain unwritten. Things we'll never know about her. She fought the war on bodies for many generations, just another black girl fighting for her edges, often accused of being too, too black to be too much, too extra, too beautiful for her own good. She was always the loudest person in the room, yet unseen and unheard, even by those who loved her, especially during the most difficult times before I was even an idea. There will be parts of her erased from the paper we hand out to everyone who turned up to pay her respect. At the end of the service, a woman approaches me her pamphlet folded into half under her armpit. She says my grandmother was a spitfire. And I cannot help but to smile because I have been known to move through the world like a volcanic eruption. My mother always says I wouldn't walk until I was sure, but once I took my first steps, I moved like wildfire. This particular sentiment of remembrance gives me solace. It is a sign from the sun that my grandmother's embers will always blaze on in my footprints. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, and so, so much is beautiful. Um, yeah, we're just endlessly grateful to you, to you all um, for today. Thank you, Marlene and Essie, so very much for being here. Thank you, Tao and Rachel. Um, everyone's just brilliant. And thank you, uh, Thurza. We'd like to thank um, Patrick and Nikkel um, and everyone at Nikkel Bushane for all their support in preparing for today. Um, we'd like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program. Today's conversation will be up on our YouTube channel and our archive uh, shortly. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a poetry reading curated by Chai Lin Chung. And you can now um, turn on your microphones, everyone, and say hello, goodbye uh, as you leave. Thank you all so much again for today. Tremendous, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.